Hey, Connor Nagenfeind here. I'm glad you are tuning in to this sermon or service. I hope it blesses you and encourages you in your walk with Jesus. If it does, you might want to share this resource with others, and you might want to find more resources on our website at edgewateralliance.org. There you can also partner with us financially and help support the advancement of the kingdom through Edgewater Alliance Church. But I hope this sermon or service blesses you. Thanks for tuning in. Well, hello again. <laughs> Baptisms are a good start to the morning, huh? It's good. Yeah, it's good. If you haven't been baptized, we'd love to baptize you if you've placed your faith in Jesus. So to start this portion of our time together this morning, I'd like to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell anyone I told you, okay? And here, here the secret is, um, sometimes, sometimes Christians disagree. I know, it's crazy, it's crazy. If you don't believe me, um, find one after the service. It shouldn't be too hard. And just strike up a casual conversation and ask them questions on things like politics, uh, the book of Revelation, or the COVID vaccine, and you will be well on your way to a fun-filled conversation of disagreement. So uh, I remember my first semester of Bible college, this just being really clear to me. And I, I went to Bible college and, and there was this big theological viewpoint that my professor held that I hadn't even heard of. It was called Calvinism. I'm like, what is that? And it's basically this emphasis on the sovereign will of God above human free will. So I just grew up with uh, what would be called an Arminian perspective that really emphasizes human free will. Like you choose to follow Jesus. Everybody has a choice. Uh, you, you either follow Jesus or you don't. Your decision. And the Calvinist professor is like, that's not, not really how it works. God chooses you. And as I'm looking at this, this is something that Christians have argued about for hundreds of years. They disagree on. And I think there's honestly room for disagreement. And uh, there's space for believers to disagree on things like what Bible translation is your favorite, when the rapture is going to take place, whether a pastor should share a personal story about going to the bathroom in the Grand Canyon, all of which, they're fair game. The people who weren't here last week are like, what? Don't skip church. It makes more sense when you come on a regular basis. So uh, there's room for disagreement. There's space, I believe, for disagreement among followers of Jesus. But it, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to core matters of what we believe, there needs to be unity and there needs to be clarity. We pick up in our series in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15 this morning, Paul and Barnabas have gone on their first missionary journey. They have returned to their sending church, the church of Antioch that had commissioned them out for the work that the Lord had called them to. They went and had incredible adventures. They experienced great opposition, but in addition, they all also saw God do incredible, wonderful, and beautiful things. And so they've come back, they've reported to the church what God had done, and they've settled into their home church for a season of ministry. And this is where we pick up today, starting in verse 1. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the Christians. Remember that Christians were first called Christians here at this church, at Antioch. Some guys show up and start to teach them the following idea. Unless you keep the ancient Jewish custom of circumcision taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. It was probably a little bit of a tough sell. Paul and Barnabas disagreeing with them, argued forcefully and at length. So these guys show up. It's worth noting that these would be uh, followers of Jesus as well. They would be people who have placed their faith in Jesus and believed that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus was the Messiah 
or anointed one that was foretold by the Old Testament. But in addition to that, they were speaking to Gentiles or non-Jewish uh, believers who had come to faith in Antioch and said, not only do you need Jesus, but also you need this set of rules that we have followed for a long time. And this got Paul and Barnabas pretty riled up. They started to argue with them forcefully and at length. This is kind of maybe a, a, a brief way of saying there was a church fight. Perhaps you sometimes read the book of Acts and you're like, man, if only I could live in the early church where they had like no squabbles, God was just doing awesome stuff all the time, and there wasn't the drama that we experience in church culture today. This would have been a church fight not a calm sort of cute theological conversation over a cup of coffee at Island Roasters. This is like congregational meeting that goes off the tracks. People's faces are turning red, palms are getting sweaty, voices are being raised. And the question is, why? Like, why was this such a heated issue? Why was this such a big deal? And I would submit to you the primary reason why this was such a heated issue and why this was such a big deal is because it was a primary issue in the Christian faith. This wasn't some peripheral issue about Calvinism or Arminianism, what version of the Bible you like, whether a pastor should wear skinny jeans. It was none of that. It, it, was, it was something that was core and central. We're literally talking about how are people saved? The grace of Jesus Christ. And this is something that there must be clarity on. This isn't one of those, let's just agree to disagree moments. This is serious and it was treated as such. They weren't able to solve this disagreement among themselves at the church of Antioch. And so this is what happens next. Finally, Paul and Barnabas were sent to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported on what God had been doing through their ministry, but then some of the men who had been Pharisees before their conversion stood up and declared that all Gentile converts must be circumcised and be required to follow the law of Moses. And this is interesting because typically when we come across Pharisees in the scriptures, we're speaking of people who are still Pharisees, have not acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, and are sort of the strictest legalists we know in the scriptures. And what's interesting in this text is that we see that there were Pharisees, people who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, who became followers of Jesus. However, it appears as though they brought some of their former thinking from their previous way of life and imputed it into and onto the Christian faith, which just so you know, is something really easy for all of us to do to take things from our culture or our belief system that really has nothing to do with the Christian faith and kind of bring it along like checked luggage. And that is what we find here. There were Pharisees who had previously been Pharisees, had now come to faith in Jesus and sort of bring their luggage, bring their baggage with them and insist 
that people who convert to the faith not only believe in Jesus, but also be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. So verse six, so the apostles and church elders got together to decide this question. What had happened was the church at Antioch was unable to get unity around this issue where they needed unity. They were at an impasse. And so they do what most people do when they're at an impasse and they need to get around the impasse. They bring in a trusted third party. This is not something we can agree to disagree on. We need to get past this. We need to get clarity. We need to bring in a trusted third party, which is a good thing to do, right? Like my kids who, who fight all the time, uh, when they're fighting, often when they, when they can't figure it out, they'll come get mom and dad. Mom and dad, come sort this out. When husbands and wives are fighting and they can't figure it out, they'll call up a pastor or a counselor and say, we're at an impasse. We need to work this out. It's a good and healthy thing to do, provided two things. One, both sides trust the third party. Both sides have to agree. You know what? That third party is credible. They have integrity and wisdom. We trust them. Both sides need to agree on that. Secondly, both sides need to submit to what the third party says. So if you're going to go to a third party, both of you need to trust that the third party is legitimate, trust that the third party is credible, and then you need to submit to what the third party says. And so this church at Antioch, they're having this issue. They cannot get unity. They need clarity. They're at an impasse, and both sides agree. The church in Jerusalem the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem, they have credibility. Let's go to them. And understand, this wasn't like, I'm going to send Peter an email. This was a 300-mile journey that would have taken a minimum of 20 days. They were committed to moving past this impasse and they go to the church in Jerusalem as a trusted third party. And here's what happens next. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. By this point, there had already been a long discussion. Both sides were able to speak. Everyone's been heard. And now it's time for Peter as a leader to address this issue and note where he stands. Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers speaking to both sides of the equation. Peter is wanting unity. You all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. What Peter is referring to here most likely is what we have studied in Acts chapter 10. Do you remember the story where Peter is on the roof of the house in Joppa? He's praying and he receives a vision from the Lord and lowered before him on a sheet is a bunch of unclean animals. At around the same time, there's a man named Cornelius uh, in Caesarea who is a centurion, not a Jew, a Gentile, who has a vision that he is supposed to send for Peter. So he sends guys to Peter Peter, Peter is under the impression from the Lord that he's to go with these men. He realizes that the vision was not ultimately about animals, but about people communicating the idea that there are no people that are off limits for God, that your race, your ethnicity, your gender All are welcomed at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And this was kind of news to Peter back in Acts chapter 10. But he goes to Cornelius' house and the Holy Spirit shows up at the party. 
And it's awesome. And Peter has this revelation from the Lord of like, I don't get first, uh, I don't, I'm not loved by Jesus more because I'm Jewish, that, that Jesus loves all people and the gospel is for all people. And he witnessed the salvation of Gentiles back in Acts chapter 10. And so he's referring to that here. God, who knows people's hearts, confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he gave him to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he also cleansed their hearts through faith. Why are you now questioning God's way by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? He's basically saying, guys, we've already had this conversation. We've already talked about how people are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And I was a witness to it. He's like, I was at these Gentiles' house, weren't circumcised, weren't following the law, and the Holy Spirit showed up and it was an awesome party. Verse 11, we believe that we are all saved the same way by the special favor of God of the Lord Jesus. At this point, Peter leans forward. He drops the mic because we read, there was no further discussion. And everyone listened as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas get up and they kind of substantiate what Peter said by, yeah, we saw the same thing. We saw these incredible things that God was doing among the Gentiles. And then James later in the chapter, who's the brother of Jesus, stands up and gives a theological defense for the same position. And then at this council, at this meeting, In Jerusalem, there is unity and there is clarity surrounding the issue of grace. And they write a letter to the church at Antioch in which it is clear that they do not need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And the church at Antioch receives that letter with joy. For the early church, grace was worth fighting for. As the church in the 21st century, we need to be aware when to overlook differences, when to agree to disagree, and when there is an issue so primary, so central to the gospel that it must be defended, that it must be stood up for. Each and every one of us, I believe, will have an inclination to one of two extremes to varying degrees based on our personality, our temperament, and our disposition. Neither one is right or wrong. They're different. Both of them need to be sanctified by the Spirit of God. So some of you uh, don't mind conflict very much. Some of you almost kind of like it. Like you like a healthy debate. You, you like to interject your opinion that might not always land well in the crowd in which you interject your opinion. You, you have boldness and, and you're not afraid to shy away from the truth. And there are a number of things about this disposition that are positive. It will be easier for you to stand up for what is true, what is good, what is right, and what is noble. But if you go rogue with this personality type and you do not submit it to the leading of the Holy Spirit, you might be inclined to be an obnoxious jerk. (laughs) So if you have conflict wherever you go, conflict at home, Conflict at work, conflict at church, 
conflict on the golf course, like how, might be you. And, and, and somehow in our culture, among some people, there's been sort of this impression that it is virtuous to always speak your mind. Understand, brothers and sisters in Jesus, that that is not a Christian virtue. In fact, if I always spoke my mind, you would not want me to be your pastor. You really would not. It is not a Christian virtue to speak your mind. James has something really serious to say about that. And the book of Proverbs would call it foolishness. You're not to always speak your mind. You are to speak the mind of Christ. And those are two different things. Boldness is good. Courage is good. Recklessness is not. The other personality type, I want to be fair and insult everybody this morning. Um, the other personality type is one that does not want to touch conflict with a 10-foot pole. You don't like it. It makes you uncomfortable. Um, you always want there to be peace. And there are some beautiful things about this personality type. Harmony and peace and love, those are things that matter very much to God. And we are to be peacemakers. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, right? And you, if this is your personality type, you might have the inclination to always pursue peace, always make sure people are getting along. But again, if this personality type is not submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, you will have the temptation to act like a coward. Because there are things that are worth standing up for. There are evils that are worth standing up against. And as followers of Jesus, we need to know the difference. There's a part uh, in a letter Paul writes where he tells two people to agree. He, I think it's Yudi and Syntyche. He says, uh, tell them to agree. And yet he doesn't even commentate on what side he is on. It seems as though there are some times in the Christian faith where issues just aren't that important and y'all just need to get along. Like get over your differences, work it out, figure it out, maybe even overlook an offense. And then there are issues like the one that we came to in the text today that are so central to the Christian faith, so central to the gospel, like we can't take grace out of the equation. So Edgewater Alliance Church, may we be a people, regardless of personality type or what your inclination is, that have the wisdom and the courage to overlook things that should be overlooked, to agree to disagree when we need to do so. And finally, would we be a church that always has the courage to stand up for the grace and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time with brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. I thank you for the baptisms that we got to witness and participate in, and we just pray a blessing over each one of those men's lives and their future and walking with you. Would you do great things in their story? Lord, I thank you for your word that shows us how to live but Lord, I pray that we would not be a people who gather for some theological, intellectual exercise where we leave and are unimpacted by what transpired here today. Holy Spirit, I ask that anything that was of you, that was meant for any one of us, that it would stick in our minds, in our hearts, in our consciences, and that you would mold us more and more into the people that you're calling us to be. And may we have the fragrance of the love of Jesus clinging tightly to his truth with grace wherever we go. 
And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I love you, EAC. Go be the church. Hey, Pastor Connor here. Thank you for uh, watching this. I hope it was a blessing to you and encouragement to your faith. If it was, you might consider sharing this resource. And additionally, if you want to support the ministry of EAC, you can do so at edgewateralliance.org and give there. One of the things we're wanting to really emphasize as a church in this season is the importance of community and doing the faith journey together. And so I don't know what that next step will look like for you. Maybe you've, you've only been watching online and this would be a season in which the Lord would have you come join us in person and meet some folks. Maybe you are here on a regular basis, but you don't have a smaller group of community that would be really beneficial to your life and faith. And so maybe you need to sign up for a class or join a small group. Maybe you're new to faith and you want to take advantage of the mentors that we have here, and you can find that on our website as well. Whatever it is for you, we'd encourage you to take that next step to lean into community. May God bless you and have a blessed week.